afternoon. Um, so I'm here to introduce you to Cameron Tadbull, who's here to present on unlocking the power of open security standards. Cameron has been working in the security and infrastructure space for several decades with a current focus on security operations. In his spare time, Cameron likes finding new and interesting ways of breaking things and hopes to figure out how to put them together one day. In today's talk, Cameron will discuss the options for open standards to allow different tools to work together and how you can build a security defense strategy while minimizing vendor lock-in. Please welcome Cameron. <laughs> Woo! All right. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm just going to start with a quick disclaimer. It's very hard to talk about this topic without mentioning vendors. I don't want to, any conversation about vendors, I don't want you to take as an endorsement or otherwise of a particular vendor, but we will talk about a few of them. Um, first, I want to talk a little bit about what the problem is with security uh, currently. And for that, we're going to talk a little bit about where we've come from, from security. It used to be that we worried about things like ID and authentication and users having a correct password, that kind of thing. Um, networking, we used to worry about networking as a security perimeter. So we would have trusted networks and DMZs and we'd worry about the perimeter security on a network. Uh, systems, we always worried about system patching levels, uh, whether there's bugs, uh, zero days, that kind of thing in our systems. Uh, and the code of our applications, um, we worry about things like, are we introducing bugs? Are we sanitizing inputs? You know, buffer overflows, all the good stuff. Uh, and then we realize that it turns out the endpoint devices that people are using, also a problem. So we need to start worrying about protecting the laptops and not just the systems those laptops are connecting to. And we have to worry about mobile devices. And then we have to worry about people. <laughs> Um, social engineering, obviously a big problem. Uh, even things like malicious employees has become more and more of a prevalent thing that we're seeing. We worry about separation of duties. And we worry about, more importantly, protecting the people that we work with. And this is a long, long way of saying that the things that security operations look at become more and more. There are more and more things that they are worried about. Everything from the physical security of a building and people all the way through to cloud environments. And in fact, we, we have all these platforms and it's just a much wider space that we worry about. And so what this has led to is the tooling space that security uses, you can't just rely on one vendor anymore. So you used to go all in on Cisco and you'd rely on them for your network security or all in on one cloud provider and rely on them for your network security. But then once you start adding things like the endpoints, mobile devices, uh, multiple cloud providers. Um, I was at a conference where they did a survey recently and 98% of people there were on multiple cloud providers. And that's pretty standard now. So you're worried about multiple cloud providers, uh, definitely endpoints, a lot of security vulnerabilities that we see in the last 12 months have been from developers' laptops being compromised. Uh, and then you worry about environments. A lot of organizations traditionally have projected production. But it turns out if somebody's looking to launch a Bitcoin miner, although that happens less now, they don't care if it runs in your dev environment, but you will when you get the AWS bill uh, at the end of the month. And so we worry about all these things. And it comes back to there's a lot of different tools for different things. It also means that a lot of the traditional security methods that I touched on, like border security, identity security, we can't trust them anymore. Because it turns out your border stops existing, especially now people work remotely. You can't rely on everyone being in an internal office network and protecting that. And so we've moved towards using what we call zero trust principles. And so these are the following three. This is Microsoft definition, but they all work around this. Number one is verify explicitly. 
Just because a user has authenticated doesn't mean we can trust that user. We have to verify every interaction and that they're authorized to do it. Uh, least privilege access. We don't just give root to anyone anymore, hopefully. Uh, we tailor access um, to what each user or each application needs. But more importantly is the last one, and that's assume breach. And that's the one I want you to sort of keep in mind from this slide, because odds are our systems are now so complex and so varied that we don't know we've been breached. And we see that time and time again with things like Optus and all the other major public breaches. They happened months ago. And companies don't realize at the time that they're being breached. And so that brings us to anyone who's worked in security has probably used the SIEM. SIEMs are sort of our aggregate of all the information we can pull from every system. Uh, is argument about what SIEM stands for. Uh, it's either security information or incident event management. And what it traditionally has been is every log that we can get or every bit of information or security um, event that we can pull from every device. You pull it into a SIEM and then you do analysis in place. So it correlates all the systems and then you try and do detection for anomalies and try to determine when you've been breached. The trouble is, we've talked about how everything is so vast and you have to protect so much now. There's no standard. So you've got Apache logs, you've got Windows events, and there's, you are doing a lot of manipulation of this data to try and correlate. Because when you're trying to detect um, an intruder into your system, you're trying to trace their jump from system to system. And none of these systems talk the same language. So you end up doing a lot of translation on different security events and security information that you pull in. And so it'd be nice if we had a standard for this, right? It'd be nice if we could go, all the security information comes in in one standard and we can do that correlation across systems. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that. And so there's been many attempts for this. Um, these are some of the standards, and I've been looking at all of those. But what is missing with all of these standards is that none have seen wide adoption. So you'll find a vendor that does one part of your security, sort of one part of your security portfolio, and they'll support one of these standards. But it doesn't help because all of your other tools aren't reporting, so you're still doing that data manipulation to get it into that standard. And then last year, came, this came along. So this is the Open Cybersecurity Schema Framework. And it's designed to solve this problem. Um, it is basically a JSON format, but it's, we'll describe it in a sec, um, it's designed to provide standard information for all your systems so that you can bring them together. So it was launched last year as a joint progr program by AWS and Splunk. However, they do not run the project. It is a open governance project. It is run on GitHub. But what it does provide is a standard taxonomy for representing security events from all types of systems. And it's rapidly growing. And so I said, it started by Splunk and AWS, um, which is a good start. They are two of the biggest companies working in this space. But they had a whole heap of very important partners sign on at the very start. And so I apologize for the giant slide of corporate logos. Uh, and this isn't even all the companies that signed on at the start. And there are more joining and supporting this. It's important, I guess, just from this slide, you understand this is a lot of the big players in the security tooling space who are backing this standard. So let's talk about OCSF. It's a very, very simple architecture to it. You have your security tools that produce events. Those events go into some kind of event storage. There is no standard or format around that event storage. 
And then you just have something subscribed to that and process it. So some examples, I said, apologies. I've got to mention vendors here because it's important to where we're going. Uh, you have things like your cloud security posture management tools that tell you, you know, monitor your cloud environments for security problems. So you have Orca and you have uh, Palo Alto have a whole series of tools as well. Um, your endpoint detection and response. So that is your laptops, your mobiles, and your servers, virtual or physical. You need all the information from those. CrowdStrike is probably the best example there. Um, platform providers. I'm going to mention AWS because I've done most of this work in AWS. But out of the box, AWS support those four things as OCF standard. So you can get OCFFs, OCSF uh, events from those four services right now. Event storage. There's really only one on the market at the moment, which is AWS. But as I said, these are just JSON logs, essentially. So you can actually store them any way you want. Um, AWS have a built-in service called Security Lake, which is their normal data lake service, but it's optimized for uh, OCSF events. And it's essentially backed by S3. And so all you're really paying for, in most cases, is just the S3 storage that you can manage like you would normally would for S3. And then you have subscribers. Um, and so subscribers are things that will take these events in and they understand the taxonomy of these events and they process them. So to date, the three commercial ones are Splunk, Datadog, Sumo Logic. They're the three main ones. Uh, if you use OpenSearch or Elasticsearch, there are OCSF support for that. So let's, let's talk a little bit about what these events actually are. And under the hood, they are just standards for representing in JSON. So you have your standard data types, which we'll cover in a sec. Uh, you have an attribute dictionary. And that's, that's important, because one of the problems you have when you're trying to correlate these events is that some systems will call an IP address an IP. Some will call it IP underscore address. Some will call it IP underscore ADDR. And so you end up having multiple names for just something like an IP address that you're trying to manage when you're trying to bring all this data together. You have event classes, which we'll definitely cover, which fit into categories. Uh, and then you can build profiles. So profiles are basically groups of event classes. And if you're familiar with the MITRE framework, and a lot of times they will map directly to MITRE. Uh, and you can do extensions, but that's not as popular. So for data types, you have scalar data types. And they are exactly what you would expect. Strings, floats, ints, booleans, standard stuff. Uh, but then we define on top of those things like timestamps. Always a fun thing to try and manage when you're getting different formats from different places. Uh, IP addresses, like I said, and even things like usernames. So you can track user IDs from system to system using consistent naming in your schema. Um, and then you have attributes. Uh, attributes are unique, and they're the things that we define in the data dictionary, or the attribute dictionary. And like all good type systems, you can have arrays of these things. Um, categories. So the categories of events are System activities, so things that happen on what we traditionally consider as systems, routers, uh, Linux servers, et cetera, Windows servers. Uh, findings are things that are reported by security tools. So again, out of your cloud security posture management tools, they'll generally go, this is misconfigured. That's reported as a finding. Uh, audit activity is your authentication, authorization, failed at login attempts, et cetera. Network activity, HTTP lookups, DNS lookups. Uh, and configuration inventory is literally just, there's a new machine on the network. The conf config of that machine has changed, et cetera, et cetera. So let's break them down. Uh, examples of system activity. Uh, you can, there are def 
defined event classes for everything right down to the kernel. So you can actually record kernel level activity um, on Linux or Windows. There's examples for both, if that's the level you want to get to. Um, there's also the Windows specific ones down the bottom. Uh, it, yeah. We'll look at a Windows one, because that's always a fun example. Uh, and this is a really good, if you're familiar with Windows events, and I can't imagine too many people here are, um, Windows Server has one good thing going for it. It's very, very good at event, but not so good at naming the events. Uh, and so here you can see, so these are the things that are in the standard dictionary for OCSF and how they map to things from a Windows event. And you can probably fairly easily imagine how things from a Linux system or any other application that you're building would match to these kind of events. Security findings, fairly self-explanatory. Um, ordered activity, so these are what I was talking about before. So these are when you create a user, a user logs in, a user fails to log in, um, when you've got somebody authenticating to an API or using an API. These are the kind of things that generally from a security point of view you care about. So here's a good example. Uh, this is, again, I'm drawing from Windows because their event format's handy. Uh, this is a failed login. And again, you can generally get a good idea of the naming. And hopefully, you can get an idea of how the naming on the left provides a more consistent pattern for events. Uh, examples of network activity that currently exist. Uh, standard stuff, DHCP lookups, remote desktop connections, SSH. Um, here's an example. This is not the full listing of what you get in the VPC flow log from AWS. But again, it's a good example of... AWS is a bit different to Microsoft in that they're very non-descriptive in their eventing. Uh, and so again, you can see it maps directly into OCSF. Uh, another one, so this is a Route 53 resolver, or a DNS lookup. And again, you can see, it's all very standard stuff. Um, but still useful, hopefully you can see the use of OCSF and the naming being a little more flexible than the standard AWS naming. And then lastly, configuration or inventory changes. So the question becomes, why? Why do we care about this? What are we, why are we worried about keeping these things? And you can't talk about standards without uh, bringing up this XKCD cartoon. Um, because it's hilarious because we've all seen it, but it's a real tale, right? If we've got all these standards, and I've said at the start, they don't really work because nobody's adopted them. Why is this one going to be different? Why is this not going to just be a different standard? And for that, we, we need to sort of take a left turn into one of my favorite projects, which is OpenTelemetry. Who here has used OpenTelemetry? Besides David, <laughs> who gets very excited about it. OpenTelemetry has sort of come out of nowhere, and because of the timing and because of the space, it's become sort of the de facto standard for all kind of telemetry and logging now. Uh, and so you look at the, a lot of the vendors that I was referring to before that are in the observability space, and they're all standardized around this. Uh, you look at pretty much any language or platform you're using, and it supports this. Um, .NET, Java, PHP, Python, everything has support for open telemetry now. Um, and the reasons for that are, it is vendor agnostic. Open telemetry is not supported by a single vendor. It's supported by every vendor now because it's an open standard. And as I said, it's platform agnostic. You can use it on every platform. Um, and the fact that it's well supported is because we've kind of hit that point where nobody wants to go with vendors anymore. They want solutions that give them the flexibility. It's a timing thing. Security events, however, work a little bit different 
than your standard observability and logs. Number one being, we need to keep them all. When you're looking at telemetry and logs from systems, a lot of times you only need to keep them for, say, 30 days for debugging. Or if you're doing telemetry, and anyone who's used OpenTelemetry will know, you can't capture everything. That is a level of data that you don't want to pay to keep. We, however, with security logs, can't do the sampling and the filtering that we can with OpenTelemetry because we don't know what we need. And this goes back to the assume breach part of, the, of what I was talking about in Zero Trust. We don't know what logs we'll need until possibly three to six months down the track when we go, ah, this user was actually breached. We need to go back and find out what have they accessed, have they leaked data, did they, what has happened. So we have bigger data sets and more importantly, a bigger cost. Not just for storing the data, but with the current way things are, because we integrate all these different tools and we bring them together into the seam like I talked about, we're trans translating that data into some kind of common format, uh, whatever the seam is generally going to use under the hood. And you're talking, for systems that I've worked on, you're talking millions upon millions of events a day. And if you're going to run into Lambda to do that, like a lot of people do, uh, Lambda costs can build up very quickly that way if you're in AWS. So it's not just the cost of storing the data and searching the data, it's translating that data. And that's why having a common standard is important. Because it means that we're not locked into these tools. Um, I've got to be very careful not to mention specific vendors when I talk about this, but there are a lot of vendors that will lock you in because they will take care of that piece for you and support you. But if you then want to go, you know what? We think this tool over here is better. It's a big lift and shift job. If you are using a common event storage and it's all in a common format, you can easily switch from one vendor to another. Um, choice of tools is the other thing. And so when we started looking at this problem and why we've started working with OCSF, is because we wanted to build our own analysis tools. Every business has unique use cases. And so what we're getting now is from all of our security tooling that supports OCSF, we're getting these standard logs that we can then go back and do analysis on, but we can build the systems that we want to do that. Um, and you get adaptive ecosystems. And by that I mean, again, you're not locked into vendors, and it gives vendors a chance to sort of innovate, or, and I'm hoping, open source projects to support this and then provide innovation that way. Uh, we've seen that with open telemetry. Open telemetry has encouraged um, things like if anyone's used Honeycomb, Honeycomb is just a really good tool that if without open telemetry would, have, would not exist the way it is. So why, why then is, do I think this standard is important and why do we need to talk about it? Number one, the timing is right. We've got this much bigger focus on cybersecurity coming not just from governments, but because of the size of the breaches that we're seeing. Companies very, very much are talking and taking this stuff a lot more seriously. We also see that companies and organizations have an absolute hunger for this kind of data representation. We've seen that with OpenTelemetry. We're seeing it with some other things. Um, so this is the right project at the right time. Um, and this is always a controversial thing to say at an open source conference, but vendor support matters. As much as we'd like the world to run 100% on open source, it doesn't. And we, if you want to keep sort of those being able to work together with these things and switch to open source solutions where possible, you need to be compatible. And um, I have not been able to find any other initiative like this that has had the vendor support that this has from very big players. Um, and more importantly, it is, this solution is a really good fit. With our experiments, it's actually a really good way of representing data for what we need to detect potential 
violations of our security policies. So, to summarize for, for this, it's a format and it is vendor and tooling neutral. And I want, I hopefully, you're seeing the advantage of that already, but I want you to take that as an opportunity in that it's being adopted. I'm talking to people who are looking at it and evaluating it now. So if you are building anything or you have any open source tooling and you generate any kind of security event, it's in your best interest to support it. Um, as I said, that's a lot of big vendors uh, who have a lot of this market space and they are super interested in getting this off the ground. Um, the reduction in cost is a big selling point. Uh, it, like When I say we spend thousands of dollars a day on manipulating security events, and we are not, I'm, the stuff I work with is not large scale. So saving thousands of dollars a day by not having to do that translation is a super big win. And just the greater flexibility, so I can switch vendors a drop of a hat. And of course, that helps you compete when it comes to paying for vendors. But it also means it's a lot easier to go, you know what, we could run our own open, open source stack over here and get the same thing. So it induces that back into the market. Uh, if you're interested in learning more, GitHub, please come. Uh, so we are almost at version one. This is how brand new it is. Uh, RC2 is the current version as of yesterday when I looked. And um, there is a schema browser. I could delve into the schema a lot further, and I'm happy to take questions on it, but um, you can actually browse the full schema online. It will say it's in draft. It will be in draft until 1.0 is released. But that is all I have. So thank you very much. And I will more than happily take questions, if anyone has any. Um, Hello. Is, is, can you hear me? Is that on? No. no. It's on. It's on. Okay. Is it? I'll just okay. talk louder. There we go. Um, do you know of any open source projects that actually do the conversion at the moment? So Security Lake, Vendor, does the conversion, anything like Fluentbit, Blogstash, et cetera, that kind of thing that is currently working on supporting this? Not, not from a emitting point of view. So they're, they're, as I said, Open Search and Elasticsearch have things for like subscribing and indexing them. Not enough open source projects and none that I've seriously seen will do that. Now you could write your own in something like Logstash. Um, Logstash, of course, you could just do that conversion yourself. But the whole point of this project is to not have to run that infrastructure. Um, again, we have some Logstash and we spend a lot of time doing the conversion from all the different formats that we have. Uh, if I could not do that, that would be awesome. So not enough is the answer. Yeah. Any more questions? So you said that past attempts at open standards in this area haven't gotten enough uptake. Yep. What was different about this one that it got so much support from the start? I Honestly, I think it's AWS uh, and then market power, if I was going to guess. I wasn't involved in that decision. Um, but Splunk, Splunk have, oh, let's talk about AWS. This is all opinion. Um, go back to my disclaimer. AWS obviously are the king's in the, um, in the cloud space. Uh, and a lot of what AWS do, they're very interested in open standards and open source where they don't own that piece, where, where if, if it's got to go to someone else, they'd rather an open standard for it. So I think their support was a big one. Splunk are uh, the 50 pound gorilla in the logging space. And I think they have seen that they need to adapt to something to this, because they're starting to lose to a lot of the newer competitors. So I, I think it's the combination of those two that have driven it. And then you look at, they've actually gone out and collaborated with all these companies. So all the, all the companies I listed were already on board and working on this before um, they announced the project. 
So it's, yeah, it's just that vendor support and a lot of the heavyweights in the market will be supporting it. Same thing we saw with open telemetry, right? As soon as you see companies like um, Datadog, for example, switching to going open telemetry first, you know that it's going to stay around. Like, that, that's them taking it very seriously. So, yeah, we just have never seen this many vendors take a standard seriously before. That's my, that's my reading of it. Yep. Any more questions? Ooh. Feels as though I can't miss the opportunity to heckle you slightly about sure. open telemetry because I know this was an idea you had in the early days when you were looking at some of this. Yep. Um, is in using sort of that open telemetry tooling, something like Honeycomb, just at a sampling level to at least have a baseline of what, you know, normal across your systems might have been for the past one or two months. Yeah. Obviously, it can't be that um, audit trail level, but what do you think of that? So, yeah, that, that, that's a good thing. So, obviously, the, the three pillars of security being confidentiality, integrity, and availability. That availability piece, we definitely still rely on traditional um, open telemetry-based I'm not going to say honeycomb, unfortunately, but open telemetry-based things for monitoring that. So this, this is not a replacement for that. This is a solution for just those security level events for that. Um, it, developers will still need open telemetry, um, and security will still need to rely on that for the availability piece. Um, but what you'll find is I talked about there's an event class for findings, and so what I'd like to see is tools that detect the anomalies in things like open telemetry and then produce a finding event. Yeah. That doesn't exist yet <laughs> that I've seen, but I'd like that. Yeah. That's kind of how the two match. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Any more questions? No? We're done. Thank you very much. Come Thank on. you.